The mist clears and the cavities glow black in the rubbled city's broke mouth. An early crone, muse of a fitful revolution, wasted by the fray, she sees her ashling falter in the breeze, her oak grove vision hesitate by empty wharf and city gate. Here it began, and here at least it fades into the finite past, or seems to. Clattering shadows whop mechanically over pub and shop. A strangely pastoral silence rules the shining roofs and murmuring schools, for this is how the centuries work, two steps forward, one step back. Hard to believe this tranquil place, its desolation almost peace, was recently a boom town wild with expectation, each unscheduled incident a measurable tremor of the Richter scale of world events, each vibrant scene translated to the drizzling screen. What of the change envisioned here, the quantum leap from fear to fire, smoke from a thousand chimneys strains, one way beneath the returning rains, that shroud the bomb sites while the fog of time receives the ideologue. A Russian freighter bound for home, mourns to the city in its gloom. Welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week, I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Derry Morning by Derek Mahan, and is recorded in memory of the poet who passed away on October 1st, 2020, a week prior to the recording of this episode. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. It makes things just that little bit easier. Derek Mahan rose to prominence on the poetry scene during the 60s and 70s. This was a common occurrence for Northern Irish poets, given the tumultuous geopolitical landscape that they grew up in. The whole world's eyes were watching the conflict that would one day become known as the Troubles. This conflict would become a defining characteristic for much of the poetry and literature produced in Ireland at that time. As critic Sarah Broom points out, poets were under intense external pressure to comment on the situation. This poem is one such commentary. When choosing the poem this week, I struggled to narrow down such a broad career. I played around with some of Mahan's poems dedicated to the beauty and contemplative quality of nature. I also looked at his poems filled with ghosts and gods and ancient guilt. But in the end, I chose Derry Morning. I feel that it manages to encompass all the techniques that marked his poetry out as something special. There is his phenomenal sense of space, the feeling of being in the landscape he is describing. You are standing there in Derry as you read. More than that, his sense of ritual and mysticism is soaked into the lines of the poem. This poem was written, like so many Northern Irish poems at the time, in response to Bloody Sunday, but in a broader sense, to the Troubles in general. A useful summary of the event and its significance in Northern Irish history can be found in the book Crisis and Contemporary Poetry. Here is a direct quote from the book itself. Bloody Sunday caused a decisive shift in the history of the Troubles. The killing of 13 civil rights marchers, and one who died later from injuries, and the widespread injury, damage and fear caused by the British Parachute Regiment in the Bogside District of Derry on the 30th of January 1972, a microcosm, a symbol of what Britain does in Ireland, haunts not only Derry and Northern Ireland, but also Ireland, England and the wider world. The massacre of civilians involved an unusually high degree of state involvement. This in no way encompasses the vast sociological, political and historical effects this event had on Northern Ireland, but it's the best I can do in such a short format. While Bloody Sunday wasn't the inciting event of the Northern Irish Troubles, it's looked upon now as a moment of rapid escalation in terms of violence and dangerous activity. As previously mentioned, there was an intense pressure on Northern Irish poets to comment on these situations. I chose this poem because it encapsulates the sense of frustration that Mann felt in his own role as an Ulster poet. In his own words, you know, I for one, and probably others, lost, uh, uh, lost patience with his role of uh, Ulster poet, and uh, couldn't wait uh, to get on to other things. 
uh, because it was a very constricting role. Somehow we seem to have it thrust upon us. In this poem, there is an urgent sense of needing to move on, not only for Mahan, but for his country as well. It's there in the opening stanza. The mist clears and the cavities grow black in the rubbled city's broke mouth. An early crone, muse of a fitful revolution, wasted by the fray. She sees her ashling falter in the breeze. Her oak grove vision hesitate by empty wharf and city gate. Here, the city of Derry is compared to an early crone, a traditional depiction of frailty and weakness in literature. It paints Derry as a city on its knees. This notion of the struggling city is furthered in references to cavities and a broken mouth. This imagery is a powerful invocation of the conflict riddled Derry. Buildings damaged beyond repair and craters like cavities left in the ground. The notion of a broken mouth without teeth, a potent symbol of impotence, something that has lost its purpose. This is in no way an ode to Derry, but rather a lament. The lament is not only for Derry though, it is also for an idea. The idea is that of freedom from political and national oppression. The central question of the stanza, and indeed the entire poem is, how high is the price of freedom? The notion of the crone is broadened as Mahan writes, muse of a fitful revolution, wasted by the fray, she sees her ashling falter in the breeze, her oak grove vision hesitate. The fitful revolution of which he speaks began as the civil rights movement of Northern Ireland, quickly radicalizing into the guerrilla actions of the IRA. He recognizes the toll all this conflict is taking on both Protestant and Catholic alike. The city, and in turn its citizens, are wasted by the fray, worn down. Mahan was himself a Protestant, but found himself questioning both sides of the dispute. He frequently wrote from this position of the objective outsider, as a man who didn't feel the sense of belonging his contemporaries did. In many ways, it made him one of the more incisive and insightful of the Ulster poets. In case there is any doubt of what he might be referring to, Mahan uses Gaelge, the Irish language, to ensure we understand which side of the cause he is referring to. Ashling here is the Irish word for dream or vision. In this case, the dream of a united and free Ireland. But it is faltering. The actions of those fighting for it may be too extreme, causing them to doubt their motivation. The Oak Grove vision is a reference to the English translation for Dira, Derry, and it simply means oak. The inclusion of this Irish language is an excellent nod to the nationalist propaganda and a call for the return of Irish culture, which was common in Republican politics at the time. From there, focus has shifted from a symbolic Derry to grim reality. Here it began, and here at least it fades into the finite past, or seems to. Clattering shadows wop mechanically over pub and shop. A strangely pastoral silence rules the shining roofs and murmuring schools, for this is how the centuries work. Two steps forward, one step back. The idea of Derry as the origin of all the conflict, which, by 1982, when the poem was written, had plagued Northern Ireland for decades, is established in these first few lines. The beginning that Mahan is referring to is the Battle of the Bogside, the event which kick-started the troubles throughout Northern Ireland. The finite past is a hope for an end, some progress towards peace. Mahan could be referencing the framework for devolution, a proposal by the English government for joint rule in Northern Ireland. Mahan knows better than to hope too much, however, as the troubles never truly fade. From here, his imagery turns from that of symbolism to documentation. Clattering shadows wop mechanically over pub and shop. A strangely pastoral silence rules the shining roofs and murmuring schools. The clattering shadows are a reference to the shade cast by the huge military vehicles that were a constant presence on the streets of Derry at the time. Their effect on the populace, one of fear and intimidation. The pastoral or countryside silence is completely at odds with Derry's urban setting. The effect these machines have is unnatural. The murmuring schools show the whispers and distrust which has seeped into the very streets of Derry. In the face of all this, Mahan seems to lose hope at the end of his second stanza. For this is how the centuries work, two steps forward, one step back. 
The message is clear. Conflict is cyclical and progress is slow. This feeling of unnatural silence is expanded upon in the third stanza. Hard to believe this tranquil place, its desolation almost peace, was recently a boomtown wild with expectation. Each unscheduled incident, a measurable tremor of the Richter scale of world events, each vibrant scene translated to the drizzling screen. The carnage wrought by the conflict has left his city empty and a macabre peace has settled in where people used to live. The aftermath and desolation, almost peace, hides what came before chaos and bloodshed. From here, the setting of Derry takes on an almost silver screen cowboy vibe, a western by Sergio Leone. Was recently a boomtown wild with expectation. Each unscheduled incident, a measurable tremor of the Richter scale. The chaos of Derry, as a result of the troubles, is revealed. Unscheduled incidents, a code for attacks and violence. The language seems oddly cool for such acts, almost technical. But this is just man's way of showing the alarming regularity with which these events occur. Their true devastation is certified by the reference to the earthquake detection system that is the Richter scale. He moves on to comment about how the rest of the world sees these events passively through their drizzling screen, whilst Derry citizens have no choice but to experience them as vibrant scenes. All this serves to show that the troubles have become a sensation around the globe, which has added an element of the surreal to the entire affair. The words vibrant scenes do not suit the subject in any way, but it was through this kind of disassociation that most of the world was experiencing the troubles in Northern Ireland. The final stanza looks to the future uneasily. What of the change envisioned here? What of the change envisioned here? The quantum leap from fear to fire. Smoke from a thousand chimneys strains one way beneath the returning rains that shroud bomb sites, while the fog of time receives the ideologue. A Russian freighter bound for home mourns to the city in its gloom. The change envisioned here is another reference to the framework of devolution, which posited an urgent need for the people of Northern Ireland to have a new opportunity to resume greater power and responsibility in running their own affairs. This action was a huge step towards peace for the time. A quantum leap, the line from fear to fire, mimics the old adage out of the frying pan and into the fire and is an indicator that man sees no hopeful future ahead. He need no longer fear the threat of violence, but can expect it instead. The language from here nosedives into the bleak and industrial. Smoke from a thousand chimneys strains one way beneath the returning rains that shroud the bomb sites, while the fog of time receives the ideologue. A Russian freighter bound for home mourns to the city in its gloom. For Mahan, the Irish landscape was inextricably tied with the bleak. Much of this influence he attributed to Beckett, but he uses it to great effect to show just how dire the circumstances in Derry have become. The smoke from a thousand chimneys shows this sense of hopeless community. Everyone is in the same boat, buoyed by the same awful circumstance. He is also worried about the threat of myth-making. The fog of time receives the ideologue. Already, the events in Derry and Northern Ireland are being gilded, turned to propaganda, weaponized to recruit more people to both sides of a bitter dispute. The poem settles as a farewell to the city. The Russian freighter is a small reference to another failed revolution in another land, one that had also been bought through empty promises and built on violence and death. All it can do as it pulls away is mourn the city as history repeats itself once more. So, why did I choose this poem? This particular poem is exemplary of Mahan's work as a skeptic and chronicler. The troubles and the subsequent pressure to write about them forged a whole generation of Northern Irish poets, almost against their will. However, some like Heaney and Longley chose a side, wrote with a theme or influence, whether consciously or subconsciously. Mann chose to do the opposite. Rather than pen a verse to promote a narrative or deliver some kind of myth, Mann chose to look at the suffering of everyone in Northern Ireland. And in many ways, it sets him apart from his contemporaries. Most importantly, this poem shows that he was a man who 
desperately wanted change to come to his country, a move away from stagnant tradition and ancient history. For me, nowhere is that want for change more apparent in his work than in this particular poem. So, how did I do? Do you agree with my reading? Or am I a million miles off? I will point out, as always, that this is my interpretation. And as such, it is very much up for debate. If you'd like to talk to me about it, or have your own thoughts on reading for the poem, or if you simply have a poem you'd like me to read on this podcast, you can get in touch in many, many places. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. Find me on Instagram at wordsthatburnpodcast. If you'd like the show notes for this week's episode, complete with full references to academic texts and criticism, you can find it at wordsthatburnpodcast.com. I'd like to take a moment and thank everybody who has reached out to me and given me feedback for this podcast. I cannot measure how nice it is to have people engage with me on one of my favorite things. If you'd like to help me out a little bit more, you can do so by leaving me a review, a thumbs up, or a rating on whichever platform you listen to this podcast on. It really helps me spread it to more people. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music for this week's episode was provided by Kai Engel and is used under Creative Commons license. As always, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your week to spend with me. And hopefully, you'll hear from me again soon.